Uh, um, I've been enjoying, this has been very thought provoking. It's making me rethink how all of legal education actually, um, I think we focus so much on litigation and uh, so it's through civil procedure, for example, um, and it's just too much of a focus and I don't think students get exposed to really the, the full variety of what we can do. And so um, today I'd like to share about some new trends, some new developments that I'm seeing, uh, some new Supreme Court decisions that came out last term that I think I, I, they reflect a significant shift. And um, I think to, order, to understand where we're going, perhaps where we may be headed, I think it's helpful to look at the past. And, and here in New Orleans, I think the past is always staring me in the face. And so I want to present the, the cases, the current cases, the cases that were recently decided last term in terms of a broader arc. And so uh, something that, that's hit me, it, it's, it's so easy for me to take for granted today that arbitration agreements are easily enforceable. But I have to remind myself that was not always the case. If I look at the trajectory of arbitration law, say from the beginning of our country till about the 1920s, pre-dispute arbitration agreements were simply not enforceable. And then all of a sudden, you see in the 1920s, right after the First World War, you see that uh, you know, several states begin adopting modern arbitration statutes. And internationally, you also see the Geneva Protocol, Geneva Convention, 1923, 1927. And domestically, the very first statute adopted was in New York, and the FAA was patterned after this New York statute. New Jersey followed in 1923, a few other states, but the FAA was in 1925. And if you look at these domestic statutes, they recognize the validity, the binding nature of pre-dispute arbitration agreements. And I think the world has really ever been the same since then. And I'm fascinated by this history. Um, I've written extensively about why these changes occurred in this particular moment in American history. And there are many deep reasons why, and uh, this is a larger topic. But my main point is that, you know, if you look at the FAA, it really is a landmark statute. Um, it's, you know, all of a sudden, almost overnight, you have um, arbitration spreading from small trade associations to really any two parties with a contract. And so I can't stress enough how landmark of a statute the FAA is. However, all of my research has convinced me that the FAA was originally designed to be used on a more limited scale. It was never intended for employment disputes or statutory claims or applicable in state court originally. Um, and also, if you recall, their vision of interstate commerce at the time, it was much narrower than we have today, before the New Deal, before the 1930s. And so I really believe that the FAA was designed. Uh, I became obsessed with this. I, I looked at the, uh, <laughs> uh, the diaries, the personal letters, the drafters, and I'm, I'm, I'm convinced they primarily designed the FAA for shipping contractual disputes that literally cross state lines. And so, uh, but something special happened in intervening years, I think in particular during the 1980s. Uh, the Supreme Court was led by Chief Justice Warren Burger, and he was a big promoter, uh, a, an excellent promoter of ADR and arbitration in particular. And ever since that time period, since the 1980s, for the last 40 years, I really think the Supreme Court's been expanding the FAA and transforming it in my mind. Um, if I look at the text of the FAA, I would argue that classic cases going back 40 years, uh, like Moses Cohn in 83, South and V. Keating in 84, uh, Circuit City in 2001, uh, Mitsubishi in 86, Gilmer 91, I think all of those cases are contrary to the text of the FAA and the purpose of the history of the FAA. And so the Supreme Court since that time, over the last 40 years, uh, they've been taking a stronger interest in arbitration, but unfortunately I think transforming the statute in my mind and uh, the Supreme Court tends to hear arbitration cases at least every other term, with a landmark five decisions last, dis last term and one case currently on the docket. And I serve as an arbitrator in commercial cases, and I can see arbitration on a narrow plane, just, you know, of course, how to resolve disputes. But I think the court may be looking at arbitration differently, almost as a safety valve for an overburdened judiciary. And, you know, courts, they help facilitate arbitration when the arbitration system breaks down. But I see arbitration as serving the, serving the public interest, serving broader society in this sense, and alleviating the, the workload of the courts. And also, at a broader level, you can view arbitration as really consistent with the freedoms we have in a democratic society, right? Like, um, it helps promote party autonomy, private ordering. Um, there are think, many reasons why the Supreme Court tends to have a strong interest in arbitration. But I think one big one is it helps alleviate the, the, you know, the overcrowded dockets in the, uh, the court system. And this is a more cynical view, it's a little bit more controversial. Um, I think I have some struggles with the expansion of arbitration. Uh, in particular, uh, with certain uses in the employment context and the consumer context, I do see, um, this is a very cynical view, but 
uh, arbitration law can sometimes be used to undermine the rights of weaker parties, and that's just a, a different, different conversation, a different debate for another day. But the Supreme Court, my point is, it, it, it's kept its finger on this pulse for the last 40 years. I don't see that trend changing. But what I do see changing, and this, I never expected this to happen, and this is really uh, a trend beginning, I think, with the uh, new Prime v. Oliveri case in, in 2019, and I see it on full display last term. Um, the, I really see this new day with arbitration law, just, uh, this new trend, and it's a more textualist approach, a focus, a, a piercing textualist approach on the FAA, on the text of the FAA. And if you look at the last 40 years of the FAA's history, um, I would say the Supreme Court is mainly focusing on a federal policy favoring arbitration and not really grounded in the, in the text itself. But the switch that I'm seeing now is that the, so the court is now focusing on the text of the FAA as opposed to the broader federal policy favoring arbitration. And this shift, I think, is significant. Uh, I love the Netflix series Stranger Things, and uh, <laughs> I sometimes wondering, am I in an upside down world? I never expected this more textual approach. I wish I would have seen this like 30, 40 years so, ago. So actually, um, I have one question for you sure, here, sure, sure. before we get to actual cases then. So with this shift now, right, and particularly the court's high engagement with the arbitration-related cases last term, like what do you see as you know making up the court's uh, heightened interest, so to speak? And, do you think it ties into, you know, perhaps trying to um, have these decisions that are more textualist in nature? So they're they're interested in taking up more cases um, to try to affect something that brings the Federal Arbitration Act, you know, more back to the text and away from the federal policy just favoring yeah, I, arbitration. I'm, I'm wondering if we're becoming more saturated with. I love arbitration. I love it. But I'm wondering <laughs> if we're becoming more saturated as a society with this broad uses, like it's an overuse in some ways. And so that could be a little bit of what's causing the restraint. And also, maybe there's a bigger uh, question about the court's legitimacy with other fields. And so they're trying to be more restrained and more textual. Maybe that mm -hmm. can explain it. Uh, but I really do see that shift, which I never expect. I, that's, for me, what's dramatic. I think all the last 40 years would have, uh, of FAA history and FAA jurisprudence would have ended up differently had we taken a more textual approach back in the 1980s. And so what are some examples of this trend? Um, if you look at the Sundance case, the Taco Bell case, the waiver case from last term, it, on an arrow plane, it deals with the topic of waiver. Just, you know, when has a party waived the right to arbitrate? Mm -hmm. And uh, before Sundance, some courts would apply a, a strong, you'd have to show a strong showing of prejudice before the right to arbitrate would have been waived. And the Supreme Court in Sundance, though, it strikes down a judge-created law regarding prejudice. R really, there's no basis for prejudice in the text of the statute. And post Sundance, I'm finding more cases finding a waiver much easily than before. And so as a side note, like if I were defending a case in court, I would move to compel for arbitration immediately. Uh, it's much easier to find a waiver today in the wake of Sundance. But had Sundance been decided 20 years ago, when there's just a, strong, a view of a strong federal policy driving these cases, I think the court would have said perhaps, you know, um, we're not supposed to find waiver that easily based on the strong federal policy in favor of arbitration. I really think that, um, this case could have turned out differently had it been decided 20, 25 years ago. And the Supreme Court, is, in a unanimous decision in Sundance, said, you know, courts should not be making up laws favoring arbitration, or rules, judge-created rules, favoring arbitration. And I think that holding is so ironic for me, because for me that explains like the last 40 years of the Supreme Court's holdings. I really think they strayed far from the text of the FAA. And one more quick example, the Badge Row case, and this deals with a, a technical issue of when does a federal court have subject matter jurisdiction over petitions like to confirm or vacate an award. And the court focuses very heavily, it was a very textual analysis, the court said that there was very strong uh, jurisdictional language at the front end of the statute, at the front of the FAA, dealing with petitions to compel arbitration, but that same language, that jurisdictional language was missing from the back end in discussing petitions to confirm or vacate awards. And this very textual, dry, this very textual approach it informed the entire court's reasoning and its holding. And if you took this textual approach back to the 1980s, I really think we'd have a different FAA today. I've been diving into the papers of Justice Blackman, his personal papers there in the Library of Congress, and I've collected the memos between the justices. I am convinced they fully knew they were transforming the statute and ignoring the text back in the 1980s. And that's for a new book project that I'm working on. But going forward, what I see is I think, I don't see this trend changing. I think the court will continue taking a very literalist, textualist approach regarding the FAA. And arbitration law has been described as a swinging pendulum. 
And uh, at least domestically, I see that. Uh, you know, before the 1920s, we may have been here where arbitration clauses were not fully supported by our judicial system or by the, by the state, by the government. Through the 1920s, though, you see the shift here with the limited FAA and similar state arbitration statutes. And during the 1980s, uh, you see the tremendous expansion. And I'm wondering, have we hit a saturation point? And I did a study, this is, it seems like ages ago in 2018, 2019, before the pandemic, but I found that there were 826 million consumer arbitration clauses enforced. And that's a very conservative amount, just the United States. And the entire population in the US is 330 million. And now I think the true numbers are actually double or triple that amount. And hypothetically, and if you were to slip in the lobby today, outside in the uh, Four Seasons, and if you made your reservations online through the Four Seasons website, guess what? You'd have to arbitrate your claims against the Four Seasons. And so, um, in my personal opinion, I, I don't know, I, I struggle with um, you know, the sense of uh, your right to be free from bodily, uh, bodily harm. I don't think it's based on a contract. In the same way, I think your right to be free from discrimination, it's not based on a contract. And uh, if you look at the NFL decision from like earlier this week uh, with Brian Flores' case, um, I, I don't think this claim should have been or subject to arbitration. Uh, if you look at the text of the FAA, it only covers disputes that arise out of a contract, and we've strayed so far away from that. And so um, and this brings me to my next point. Uh, I, I would say that this surprised me as well. Uh, there was bipartisan support in Congress last year, exactly a year ago, um, for I think what was the most significant amendment to the FAA since its enactment, basically prohibiting uh, the arbitration of uh, sexual assault or sexual harassment claims. And I'm strongly in favor of the goals of this amendment. Um, however, I think that the amendment was poorly drafted, and actually it's unconstitutional as applied to some state courts in some certain situations. And uh, just last week, uh, the Southern District of New York issued two opinions, I think, misconstruing the amendment. Um, and I think that because the amendment was poorly drafted, we're going to continue seeing conflicting decisions on how to interpret this amendment. But um, I'm hoping that going forward, if we have reached this, the height of the pendulum, I do see the Supreme Court taking a more restrained approach regarding arbitration. And I'm hoping to see some uh, more restrained uh, other limited reforms that may be passed in Congress. You know, for the last at least 10 years, we've attempted to have sweeping reforms, and they've all died out in committee. I don't think we're gonna see something like that, but we may see more limited reforms at the congressional level, and also perhaps at the state level. I think the Badgerow case and the Viking River case from last term may spur some state, for, uh, state reforms. And I just wanna conclude with a reminder, um, I'm excited about this, it's the uh, 100th anniversary coming up of the FAA. This is in uh, February 2025, and so I think there may be some momentum in some perhaps modest reforms to the FAA. This statute, it was designed for a different time period. Uh, I, I think it's, we've far, uh, far outgrown its use. It's, uh, I think it's so outdated. Um, and I'd, I'd be happy to work pro bono with my students, with anyone here, for any type of amendment you're thinking about. I've done a lot of research on this. All types of amendments, you know, pro-business amendments, minor reforms, or even sweeping reforms. I'd be happy to work with anyone after this is over. Um, but I believe that uh, most major economies in the world have updated their arbitration laws, but not the U.S. I think it's really time for that. It's, the time is ripe for that. So I hope to see the business community and legal community coming together, just like they did 100 years ago, to promote arbitration reform. And, um, and so I think one possible change it could be incorporating some more uh, disclosure rules or ethics concerns or maybe dealing with AI, and that leads to our, yes, our next step. Yes, exactly, uh, right. That wasn't planned at all, the lead-in. So, so the next topic, um, so Amy's going to chat here about AI and technology um, you know, in arbitration. Uh, so Amy, do you want to kick it off? Thanks, Carmela. Hello, everybody. Welcome to your pre-lunch talk about robots and the future. <laughs> uh, no, all joking aside, I, I like to start these conversations. A AI and ethics is an issue kind of dear to my heart, and also being in Silicon Valley, you just can't get away from it. Um, so how many people in this room, show of hands, uh, would consider developments in AI concerning? Me too. Okay. I will be reporting that to the AI. <laughs> how many people in this room consider developments in AI exciting? Oh yeah, scary things can be exciting. Uh, and how many people in this room um, feel as if they're suffering from a syndrome called FOMO, which Black's Law Dictionary defines as fear of missing out when it comes to AI. Yeah. <laughs> so um, full disclosure, these are 
largely my own views. They don't represent those of Arnold and Porter. And I'm not an AI scientist and wouldn't even purport to be. In fact, I think we should all be skeptical of anyone who claims mastery of this topic because it's just evolving rapidly in front of our eyes. Uh, last audience poll, how many of you have messed around with chat GPT in the last couple of weeks? Okay. How many of you have messed around with chat GPT while at this conference? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I know, I saw. Uh, Someone's on it right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How to give an excuse for skipping this panel. Um, no, and I, you know, I think it's really interesting because it has captivated our imagination and it's going to transform not only the way we practice law, but the way we do business. And I would go so far with my California bias to say that in this day and age, every company really is a tech company. You know, you may be in oil and gas and extractive resources, petrochemicals, um, construction, or software design, but everybody is going to start implementing this technology into the way they do work, into the way they hire employees. <laughs> and for those of you who deal with legal risk and ethics, they're going to have to deal with employees who are incorporating this technology even when they're not supposed to be doing that. Um, whether that's using uh, generative AI to generate a social media post that you don't like or you know, making a shortcut and doing some legal research. So this is gonna be front of mind for all of us and we've only got about 10 minutes to dive into this topic today. Um, so I wanna touch on a, on a couple of elements. First, uh, just to talk a little bit about what is this kind of quantum leap we're seeing in artificial intelligence. Um, it's, Generative AI is kind of the buzzword you're hearing, or ChatGPT, what's that? That's a large language model that operates on data compressed through a transformer, uh, which is basically like a programming device that takes a whole bunch of information and squishes it down. If anybody's seen the sitcom Silicon Valley, you have an idea of what compression looks like. Um, and what it's very good at doing is predicting the next best word. Um, and it's very different from kind of a lot of the legal industries foray into artificial intelligence because everybody here will have heard the term predictive coding, will have used predictive mm -hmm. coding. Um, that's a form of supervised machine learning. We are now very much in the era of unsupervised machine learning. So you don't need that machine to rely only on the trading, training data that you input. Of course, it runs off of training data. In fact, ChatGPT is scraping the whole internet, right? I mean, that's the same thing that Bing Sydney is doing. Um, but it's not that the human is absent, because the way that this software gets better, develops, predicts what you want, falls in love with you, for any of you who've read the New York Times article, <laughs> um, is through something called reinforcement learning, which is a, a human feedback loop. And this idea of human assistance is really important to keep in mind. We're not going to have you know, robot lawyers who generate everything. And frankly, the courts aren't gonna let us do that either. And neither is the American Bar Association. Right. <laughs> Some of you may have seen these resolutions that the ABA has issued. Um, the first one came out back in 2019. I actually yeah, have it Yeah, we've got down. August 12 to 13 in 2019 was the first yeah. resolution. And then recently, February 6th, 2023, we have another resolution going into exactly these topics. So I can just preview a couple of these things oh, and maybe I mean, you could touch on it. I actually, I think maybe one thing that would be interesting is to ask the audience again, how many of you in this room think that we need a specific ethical rule for dealing with artificial intelligence? So, okay. <laughs> um, so it's interesting because the ABA has stopped short of promulgating a model rule. But what they've said is that lawyers have a duty to consider the ethical and legal issues around AI. Uh, back in 2019, there was a big focus on bias, explainability, and transparency. That's still important. But now in 2023, with resolution 604, you're also seeing control and accountability coming into play. And I think as the legal community is starting to understand and come to grips with the power of this technology, they're starting to realize that those obligations are, you know, stretch beyond just being able to explain what's happening and to actually be accountable for what's happening, which is a little bit terrifying. So I actually have a question there. Yeah. So, because I found this to be very interesting, right? Because this is, AI seems great, but again, right, it, you need oversight, right? And that it, it all plays into the system. So the ABA resolution makes a comment that, uh, this is the most recent one, that responsible individuals and organizations should be accountable for the consequences caused by their use of AI products, services, et cetera, et cetera. So one question I had was, who do you choose to be the accountable 
person for that, right? Is it someone who is, you know, the person who's more technical? Is it a, a lawyer? Is it a person who has both? Like, you know, is it management at a company? So I don't know if you have any thoughts or if that's been, you know, discussed at all. But I was just curious about, you know, if you're fixing liability to whoever is overseeing the AI systems. Um, how that's playing out. Well, so let's not worry anybody. There is an exception in the ABA <laughs> guidance for taking reasonable steps to mitigate harm and injury. So you're not strictly liable for what the AI does necessarily. Um, and I think that the answer is an issue kind of near and dear to my heart, which is that it's, it's not just legal and it's not just the business. It is, we have an obligation, I think, as lawyers, and this is actually enshrined in the duty of competence, which applies in almost every US jurisdiction. Uh, to have a technological fluency, right? No one in here is going to have the time, unless you have a really cushy job, um, to get in front of all of the AI science. But we do have a duty to know what we're talking about, to know that language, and to understand what we're putting into use. And a great example of this is the concept of AI hallucinations. I guess another hand-raising moment. Who's familiar with an AI hallucination? No, I swear this isn't a California thing. This is a real thing. <laughs> So my colleague, Beatrice San Martin, some of you in life sciences may know her, she's based out in London, um, was taking note of certain magic circle firms that were promoting their use of AI capacities. She said, oh, that's interesting. I'm gonna ask ChatGPT to find me a perfect case on point for this tricky legal issue. I'm just gonna see what it says. Types it in, comes back, miraculous. Case is exactly on point. Oh my gosh, we're all losing our jobs. Except it was a hallucination. It was entirely fictional. Uh, the algorithm had just gone in and said, oh, that's what Beatrice wants. That's what I'm going to give her, right? <laughs> and she thought, well, oh, maybe that was just a one-off. So she put it in a couple more times. <laughs> nope. Just kept making up perfect cases, right? <laughs> and so I think you know, we're talking about technological fluency. It's not just knowing about the capacity of that technology, but about its really important limits. And the ABA is trying to give us some guidance. But one thing that is fascinating now is that the government is asking corporations and lawyers for guidance. The FDA issued an opinion asking, uh, well, it's kind of a, a commentary letter asking companies to explain how AI was working in their drug production processes, for example, and could AI be considered a condition in that process. The USPTO just formed a task force on artificial intelligence and emerging technologies, and they want to know what we think, as a group of lawyers, as a group of companies, as innovators, about AI and inventorship, right? Because some of you may be familiar with this famous case brought by Dr. Thaler saying that his algorithm uh, should have patents, right? And the Federal Circuit struck that down hard. Um, but the PTO is now considering that issue. So we have this opportunity to engage. Um, with your indulgence, Carmela, yes, I'll take just one minute to answer the question that may be top of mind for this audience, which is, uh, okay, great, so how is this gonna come into play in dispute resolution? Um, I think it's helpful to know that this technology, these large language models, this is something that's been around since the 1970s, so longer than some of the people in this room. Um, but what's really changed over the last several years in a, in a massive way is the compute power that's available to run these equations and the data that's available to train them, which, as we talked about, is the whole internet. But one thing that's really interesting is MIT estimates that by 2026, these models will have run out of material on the whole internet to train. Uh, why is that relevant to a discussion about ADR and tools in our practice? Because to really harness this technology, you need a large proprietary data set if you're gonna be using it as a company, and you need a lot of compute power. And so I think we have a little bit of breathing room on these tools until that cost for that compute comes down. But then I would expect anybody who's running a large corporation here to be harnessing those models within their company. Um, a couple of ways that can work. Uh, combing through sensitive documents and emails to prep witnesses and to understand your case, to run an early case assessment. Um, training your transformer model on DCF equations and having a better understanding of damages calculations and having a way to present that to the tribunal that is dynamic. But even earlier than we get into 
when we get into disputes, this can be a tool to help negotiate and renegotiate contracts, looking through the history of the company, preferred clauses, even the history of disputes. So it's out there and it's coming. Uh, what is it not gonna do? <laughs> it's not gonna replace uh, arbitrators. Uh, Gene asked a really good question the other day. Well, if you have a smart contract and you can put the inputs in, can it just spit out a resolution? It could. We're gonna get existential here for a minute. Is that logic or is that reasoning? Because if you need a reasoned award, that question becomes really important. And I think we're gonna have to ask ourselves in the name of expediency, are we okay with a mathematically calculated award or do we want it to be reasoned? And, and I'll stop here, is reason human? Or is it something that a machine can do? Um, so a lot of questions out there. Arnold and Porter has a working group on AI. We host roundtables with scientists. If anyone else is interested, please let me know. I could geek out on this for hours, but <laughs> I won't abuse so, everyone's yes. time. Well, we're going to have a couple of minutes. Well, we'll have 10 minutes at the end for questions, so we can obviously come back to this topic. But next, we're going to touch on some international issues. Um, and Nicola is going to speak uh, about the uh, investment treaty reform. So. Thank Take it you. away. Thank you, Carmela. Thank you to CPR for inviting me to join this panel as well. Um, I want to talk about hot topics in international investment arbitration, pulling out of 2022 and going into 2023. So 2022 saw a real dichotomy between states either altogether abandoning their investment treaty arbitrations on the one hand, um, or, or at least their, their agreements within investment treaties to arbitrate on the one hand, or attempting to reform those treaties or those arbitration agreements on the other. And those are the two themes that I'll touch on a little bit today. So first on abandonment. Um, states exiting treaties and entering treaties is not new. States have been doing this for a number of years. But what made headlines in 2022 was the announcement of EU member states and that they were going to be exiting their intra-EU investment treaties, as well as an instrument called the Energy Charter Treaty, which has been referred to on a number of occasions uh, this week. The Energy Charter Treaty is a multilateral agreement um, it's entered into by almost 50, uh, sorry, over 50 states, the majority of whom are, are um, EU member states. It's been enforced since 1998, and it was really um, aimed at promoting cooperation and investment um, in the energy sector. The decision of the EU member states follows a number of important decisions from the Court of Justice of the European Union, which I'll refer to as the CJEU. It's the highest court in the European Union. And some in the room may have heard of a decision uh, called Achmea, the Achmea Judgment, in which the court, the CJEU, held that an arbitration agreement included in an intra-EU investment treaty was incompatible with EU law on the grounds that it impaired the autonomy and the uniform application of EU law. We don't have time to go into that decision in detail, but in a nutshell, it found that the bilateral investment treaty was in violation of EU law because the tribunal that was um, established under that treaty could be called on to interpret and apply EU law on a dispute between an investor and the state. And that interpretation could not be effectively challenged or put to the Court of Justice of the European Union and therefore it was undermining the court's role as the final ar uh, arbiter of EU law. That was a 2018 judgment. It was followed in 2020 by a decision of the EU member states to exit their intra-EU investment treaties, which would implicate around 130 treaties. It was then followed by a number of other decisions. So in 2021, the court decided in a case called Comstroy that the arbitration clause of Article 26 of the Energy Charter Treaty uh, was also incompatible with EU law. So taking the ACMEA decision and applying it to now a multilateral investment agreement, the Energy Charter Treaty. And in the same year, the court ruled in another case um, that its reasoning also extended to ad hoc arbitration clauses. Now, since the ACMEA decision, uh, most arbitral tribunals have rejected objections to jurisdiction on the grounds of ACMEA. But in 2022, we saw the first arbitral tribunal accept or accept that argument and decline jurisdiction on the grounds that the Energy Charter Treaty does not contain a valid agreement to arbitrate. This is the case of Green Power versus Spain. And then to add to the complexity of all of this, in June last year, five claimants commenced a case before the European Court of Human Rights saying that member states' um, involvement and participation in the Energy Charter Treaty 
amounted to a violation of their human rights. There's not much that's been said on that case, but it's clearly a complex situation in Europe at the moment. So looking ahead to 2023, it remains to be seen whether additional states are going to announce their exit from the Energy Charter Treaty, from bilateral investment treaties, or potentially even other treaties on grounds of EU law, human rights, politics, or otherwise. And it remains also to be seen whether additional arbitral tribunals will decline jurisdiction on grounds that there isn't a valid agreement to arbitrate. Something we might also look out for is whether investors or state investors that have awards um, from intra-EU BIT tribunals will now seek to enforce those awards outside of Europe, in the, in the United States, for example. So if those are some of the trends on, on exit, what do we see um, on reform last year and going into this year? There are multiple parallel discussions happening on investment treaty ar um, arbitration reform as well as investment treaty reform. Um, the substance of investment treaties, and in particular the, the role that they play in states seeking to achieve the objectives of the Paris Agreement on climate change, has been the key focus of a lot of these discussions, particularly at the OECD, among state parties to the Energy Charter Treaty, and 2023 will see those discussions continue apace. I want to discuss on a separate set of reform discussions under UNCTRL Working Group 3. UNCTRL is a working group of states and um, other observers, and it's been mandated by the UN Commission on International Trade Law, or UNCTRL, to discuss investor state reform. And it's got a very broad mandate, um, but I want to focus on one particular work stream that the group is focusing on last year and this year, which is a code of conduct for arbitrators. So it may be of, of general interest to some of those in the room. So one of the key focuses last year was developing a near final draft of this code and some of the provisions will be familiar so um, it, it would apply to investment arbitration disputes um, that includes disputes under treaties but it would also include disputes brought under contracts or under legislation so it's broader than just a treaty dispute um, familiar requirements include arbitrators having high standards of integrity fairness civility possessing necessary competence not to delegate their decision making no ex parte communications except for narrow circumstances during the appointment stage. Um, provisions on stipulating that fees and expenses need to be reasonable and in accordance with the instrument establishing jurisdiction or the applicable rules. Um, and there are also provisions on independence and impartiality and related disclosure obligations. Um, those disclosure obligations and questions around impartiality and independence have caused quite a bit of debate in the legal community. Should independence and impartiality and the obligations for them be judged from the perspective um, from, of a fair-minded observer, so an objective standard similar to what you might find in the challenge, arbitrator challenge circumstances, or from the perspective of the parties that are involved for subjective approach? There are different approaches whether you look at the UK. The uh, UK doesn't even have a requirement for independence. It looks solely at impartiality. And it looks at it from the perspective of the parties that are involved, not from an objective perspective. Now, um, should there be a mandatory set of disclosures, or should there be a broad requirement to disclose anything that may be relevant? The mandatory uh, disclosures has the advantage of a bit more certainty for the parties involved. But is that prescribed set of disclosures too limiting, um, too narrow? Does it become too overburdensome for the arbitrator? The current proposal by Ancestral Working Group 3 is to have a broad disclosure requirement. There's still a debate as to whether that will be a subjective or an objective approach, plus a number of specific facts that need to be disclosed by an arbitrator. These include financial business professional relationships with the parties um, involved, um, but it, it has a time limit now of five years, and that's been hotly debated, whether it should be longer or shorter personal financial interests in the proceedings or related proceedings um, must be disclosed. Appointments as counsel or arbitrator in investment disputes in related proceedings, like enforcement and annulment proceedings, need to be disclosed. Again, that's got a time limit of five years that's been hotly debated. As well as any other appointments by a disputing party, again, within that time period of five years prior to the arbitration in question. I understand that there was a provision that required all publications and public statements to be disclosed, um, but thankfully that was uh, scrapped and not agreed to. Um, 
There was a panel on Wednesday when Judge Elizabeth Ray said that she'd asked someone to write a tailored piece of software for her that records and draws up categories of facts that would be relevant to disclosure. And it strikes me as a very good idea as we start to move towards a more prescribed list of disclosures that are required in international arbitration. Perhaps the most hard fought issue, and I'll stop after this, is something called double hatting. This occurs when an arbitrator in an investment treaty arbitration also acts as an expert or as counsel in another arbitration under an investment agreement. Um, why is this cause concern? Well, you can imagine on the one hand an arbitrator may be hearing from the parties on the provision of law in one arbitration and then arguing on behalf of a client for an interpretation on that same provision in a different arbitration. So there's been some concern caused by that, but to put in perspective how common this, in, this is, one study of over a thousand arbitrations found that double hatting occurs in over 58% of international investment treaty arbitrations. So rules on this topic will have a significant impact on a number of, of cases. What are the proposed reforms? Well, the outright ban on double hatting has been scrapped, um, but there is now a proposed ban on double hatting um, where an arbitrator is involved in cases that have the same facts, so the same measure, the same state action in question, so the same or related parties, or the same instrument of consent, whether that's a treaty, a contract, or um, a legislation. There are also discussions around something called a cooling off period, which will prohibit an arbitrator from taking on an appointment after the arbitration in question has been concluded. Again, that would be limited to cases involving same parties, similar facts, same instrument of consent. But there are a lot of questions that flow from this idea of a cooling off period. There's no consensus on how long that will be. Will it be six months, three years, five years? Does this cooling off period give the parties to the concluded arbitration some say in who separate parties in a separate arbitration can appoint as arbitrator? How do we rationalize questions around confidentiality or contractual privity, party autonomy. There's also presently a draft provision that would require an arbitrator to, to disclose, a, who, an arbitrator who's appointed in an ongoing arbitration to disclose a potential appointment as counsel or expert in another arbitration, essentially disclosing a potential incident of double hatting. But the commentary to that provision states that if the arbitrator goes on to accept the appointment, that would be a ground for challenge reads somewhat like an outright ban on double hatting. So it remains to be seen again whether that will survive the ongoing discussions. These discussions are continuing throughout 2023. This month, the uh, committee will be dis discussing this point on double hatting, and there'll be a potential conclusion of this code this year, something to look out for, particularly if there are ongoing discussions elsewhere around procedural form of, of arbitration, because I think these types of questions have relevance beyond investment treaty arbitration. They spill over into commercial arbitration. We've seen the, the former president of the ICC discuss these specific reforms in the context of, of commercial disputes and contractual disputes. So, yeah, so with there. that, we're going we're gonna to turn to Naui in a moment. But if we have time, maybe we can return to the idea. We we're just talking about all of these like potentially you know, updated disclosure rules. And um, you know, we can maybe talk about like, like the use of technology in facilitating that and making that easier. I, you know, I, that's a topic I'm curious about, too. We talked about that a little bit. You brought it up with, that, um, with the database that uh, yeah, the judge already brought up. So OK, so now we're going to return stateside now. And we're going to talk about um, some pending, de uh, pending decision be before the Supreme Court, um, uh, Coinbase. So if you want to take us away on that. Yes, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Carmela. Um, it's a pleasure to be here at. Um, the, is my mic off? Yeah. Uh, not just. Let's get a bit closer. Yeah. So it's a pleasure to be here at the uh, the first in-person AM since the pandemic. Thank you so much to CPR for inviting me to be on this panel, and to my excellent co-panelists and everybody for joining us uh, for this discussion. As Carmela mentioned, I'm going to be looking at some of the kind of. Uh, potential developments on the horizon in US arbitration law. And um, so kind of bringing it back to the FAA, and I think this is a, very much speaks to, uh, to Imre's presentation because many of the issues that could potentially find their way to this court um, concern issues that don't have a clear textual resolution in the FAA. 
And so it'll be very interesting to see how the court approaches those issues. And so I'll start with uh, the Coinbase case that's, that's currently pending before the court. Uh, I'll kind of just you know, explain the procedural background, the arguments of the parties, and, and the implications of the case for US arbitration law. Um, so you know, this is all, it's already before the court. Uh, the court granted cert last December. Um, and oral argument is scheduled for March 21st. It raises important questions related to the interpretation of the FAA. Um, the issue is whether an appeal on a district court's denial of a motion to compel arbitration is automatically stayed, um, if it, or whether it automatic, the appeal automatically stays the underlying litigation uh, pending resolution of the appeal. So this implicates uh, really implicates key goals uh, associated with arbitration, and so naturally it's captured the attention of the of the legal community and drew amicus briefs from at least nine organizations, including the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. So, by way of background, the appeal involves two consumer class actions against Coinbase, a cryptocurrency exchange platform, in uh, Bielski. A Coinbase user alleges that a scammer pretending to be a PayPal representative defrauded him out of roughly $31,000 worth of crypto and um, claims that Coinbase only provided a very ineffective automated consumer response system and so has brought, uh, has brought a consumer class action with similarly situated uh, claimants in the Northern District of California. Uh, the second case is Suski, in which uh, Coinbase users allege that Coinbase and its marketing firm, Martin Kane, violated California consumer protection laws in connection with a uh, Dogecoin sweepstakes. Uh, basically, they say that um, the marketing materials for the sweepstakes misleadingly suggested that they had to transact $100 worth of of Dogecoin in, in order to enter the sweepstakes, when in reality they just had to send in an index card with some biographical information. So in both cases, Coinbase, Coinbase unsu unsuccessfully moved to compel arbitration based on arbitration clauses in its user agreements. In Bielski, the, the Northern District of California said that the uh, arbitration clauses were unconscionable. And in Suski, the Northern District of California said that the arbitration clauses were superseded by uh, exclusive forum selection clause in favor of California courts in the terms of the sweepstakes. And in both cases, Coinbase, Coinbase um, uh, uh, sought an interlocutory appeal of the rulings. Um, and that's provided for under Section 16A. Of the, of, the, of the FAA. And um, in both cases, the Ninth Circuit, um, you know, in, in both cases, Coinbase sought to stay the underlying proceedings pending resolutions of those appeals, and the Ninth Circuit denied that um, in, in both cases. So Coinbase petitioned for, for CERT before SCOTUS jointly in the two cases, and in its petition, Coinbase argued that there's an entrenched circuit split on whether an appeal um, on a ruling denying a motion to compel arbitration automatically stays the underlying proceedings. Um, and you know that kind of started with a 1990 decision by the Ninth Circuit in Britain, um, where um, you know the Ninth, Ninth Circuit said that a district court has discretion to decide whether the appeal stays the, the pending litigation. Um, but only the, the second and fifth circuits have followed that reasoning, and uh, the six other circuits to consider the issue have, um, have all held that an appeal automatically stays the underlying litigation. So Coinbase's argument is very much based on the, the general rule stated by a 1982 Supreme Court decision in Griggs, which says that an appeal divests a district court of control over the aspects of the, of the case that are on appeal. And so Coinbase argues that you know, Griggs applies because the entire purpose of their appeals is to determine whether the district court has jurisdiction to decide the merits. And uh, Coinbase also argues that providing um, for an interlocutory appeal of rulings on motions to compel arbitration um, makes it clear, by doing that, the FAA makes it clear that Congress intended for an appeal to stay, to stay the litigation.
Um, and then Coinbase also argues that um, under the FAA, an arbitration agreement creates a right to avoid court proceedings, which is lost irrevocably at the moment the court proceedings continue while the appeal is pending. The point, the, the, plaintiffs, um, the plaintiffs argue that section three of the FAA provides for an automatic stay once a court refers a dispute to arbitration, but doesn't provide textually for an automatic stay while um, an appeal is, is, um, is pending on, on, on in, in, in the, in the um, on whether, um, uh, on a motion, on a ruling on a motion to compel arbitration. So uses that contract, so makes it a textual argument that, um, that there should not be an automatic stay while the, uh, while the appeal is pending. So what are the implications and why has this case captured a, a lot of attention? Um, well, just to name three, First of all, um, notwithstanding the very busy uh, Supreme Court docket on arbitration-related matters last term, um, the, Supreme Court, the Supreme Court cases weighing in on the FAA can be few and far between, so we certainly welcome uh, decisions that bring greater clarity and predictability to the practice. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, the question of whether the appeal stays the underlying litigation implicates really two of the fundamental goals that we associate with arbitration. So cost efficient and confidential dispute resolution. If the appeal does not automatically stay the litigation, it means that the parties can be subject to costly and public litigation that would be entirely superfluous in the event that the ruling denying the motion to compel is reversed on appeal. And so Coinbase and various of the Amici have argued that allowing litigation to proceed pending resolution of the appeal is inefficient for both the parties and the judiciary. Um, and the, the cost that you know, we're talking about here uh, could be exponentially larger in consumer class actions such as the Coinbase cases that feature class-wide discovery. Also, avoiding uh, unnecessary costs and unwanted publicity and litigation could put pressure um, on parties to settle uh, while, the, uh, while the appeal is pending. Um, and then a final reason is that the case implicates kind of the emerging litigation landscape in the, uh, in the FinTech space. Um, digital offerings in the FinTech space typically involve arbitration agreements like those at issue in, in Coinbase. Mm -hmm. So that's a, another reason why it's, uh, it's drawn a lot of attention. So that's the Coinbase case. The question is, um, you know, at the heart of one of the longest running circuit splits concerning the FAA. And so stay tuned because the Supreme Court will weigh in this term. And we're going to get to questions, but just briefly, do you want to touch on um, the Beijing uh, mining case? Yeah. Because that's one that I found interesting. So. Yeah, absolutely. So um, just last year, the Supreme Court denied cert in a case called Beijing Shuhang Mining versus Mongolia. And in doing so, it left in place a Second Circuit decision which expanded the standard for determining the kind of conduct that constitutes a clear and unmistakable waiver of a party's right to de novo judicial review on questions of arbitrability. So as you know, I think all of us know, the FAA grants um, federal district courts a jurisdiction to consider certain issues of arbitrability de novo. Um, and in 1985, the Supreme Court issued a landmark decision in Kaplan holding that parties can agree to delegate to arbitral tribunals exclusive authority to determine issues of arbitrability, um, and even if those issues would typically be reserved for, for judicial for, for judicial courts, but the parties have to do so by uh, clear and unmistakable conduct. So the Beijing mining case is really interesting because it's it appears to be um, the only case um, that really looks at conduct uh, apart from the arbitration agreement itself. Certainly. Um, Kaplan and most of its progeny appear to focus on the language of the arbitration agreement mm -hmm. as the relevant conduct. But in Beijing Mining, the Second Circuit held that a party had clearly and un unmistakably delegated uh, the issue of arbitrability to the arbitration tribunal uh, by agreeing to a procedural schedule for jurisdictional issues. Um, and so the clear and unmistakable delegation standard is an area to watch. 
for further developments because um, it will be interesting to see what other types of conduct mm -hmm. could, could also potentially constitute a clear and unmistakable intent to delegate. Well, I also found it interesting because I think it brings us full circle and then we'll open up for questions. But you, know, you had talked about that FAA amendment, which said that, um, the, so that amendment um, about the sexual assault or sexual harassment disputes arising after March 3rd, 2022, um, its applicability has to be decided by court, not an arbitrator. Um, so as a result, that could override contractual terms that purport to delegate those decisions to the arbitrator. So you know, I, I thought that dichotomy was interesting and we'll see sort of where that, where that goes. But we only have a couple of minutes. We want to open up questions and I see we have one. So we have a couple, that's great. I have a question for Imre about um, the Elvery Realm um, cases that Judge Inglemeyer decided last week. You, you said um, two things. One is he got it wrong, and two, there are constitutional implications of the, of, of the statute and the decision. And I just wanted to ask if you could follow up on that. Sure, sure. Uh, so if you have a lawsuit with multiple claims, and one of them includes sexual assault or sexual harassment, what happens to the other claims? In my view, if the other claims have a nexus, if they come from the same transaction or event, they're also covered by this new amendment and they can't be forced into arbitration. Um, I think that the Southern District of New York took a broader view that um, pretty much claims are related if they're in the same lawsuit. And so the entire lawsuit is frozen. Um, it, 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 the entire lawsuit will stay in court. And so I would take a narrower view of the amendment to only cover uh, related claims. I, I can't see the policy behind the amendment wouldn't support stopping arbitration for a claim that has factually nothing to do with sexual assault or sexual harassment. So I think it was overly broad. And the constitutional concern is that um, this amendment applies to state courts for state law claims. Can you imagine Congress telling a state court, this is how you're going to conduct discovery, this is how you conduct pleading? I think Congress has no power over the procedure in state courts for state law claims. And that's exactly, I love this amendment. I mean, I'm heavily in support of this amendment, but I think it's unconstitutional as applied to state courts for state law claims. Just one follow-up. Um, the, the statute doesn't say claims. It says cases. I think that's where Engelmeyer, that was his hook. Yes. And yes. you think he's wrong by, by, by focusing on the word case. Yeah, I would interpret the word case more narrowly to include just a bundle of related claims that involve the same uh, factual underpinnings. And so uh, maybe a retaliation claim would also be covered by this uh, by the amendment, but um, not like a uh, a claim for mealtime breaks. So that, but I, I read that Southern District of New York case as too overly expansive. It just wasn't careful. It didn't, and it didn't give a good reason, I think, for why to freeze the entire, why to keep the entire case in court. I didn't like the court's reasoning. It was very weak there. Yeah. And I think we had another question. Yeah, right over there. Hi, uh, Jason File from Cooley in New York. Um, I have a question, an FAA question for uh, Imre and uh, Nawi. I'm not going to ask about the Coinbase case because I'm representing them in that case. Um, but the the uh, one thing that I thought was interesting about this, when especially Imre, you were talking about the the move to, uh, uh, sort of towards textualism and away from the sort of potentially pro-arbitration policy issues in the Supreme Court. Um, one thing that makes the United States uh, different from a lot of other um, uh, countries with very developed arbitration law is that we have this sort of federal and state sort of level of arbitration law. Um, I think at least 10 states have implemented um, some version of the UNSTRAL model law on international arbitration. Um, many more states have, have either, you know, a version of the revised Uniform Arbitration Act or, um, you know, the famous CPLR Article uh, 75 in New York. And there's kind of a very complicated relationship between these two levels of arbitration law because on one hand, you have cases like Volt Information Sciences that allow those state laws to have a kind of gap filling function uh, that can supply more detail where the FAA is silent. But then you also have cases like Preston against Ferrer, which will sort of cap that if it looks like that state law is, is being hostile to arbitration or to enforcing arbitration agreements or, or a pro-arbitration policy. So I guess my question is if, if the, um, if there is going to be this kind of move away toward, from a, a pro-arbitration policy kind of writ large, does that mean that state arbitration laws will become more important um, in, in governing uh, arbitrations in the future? And does that also mean that then the choice of the seat of arbitration in different American cities becomes even more important? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, um, the Volt decision, I think, from the 1980s, 
recognizes a role for state law. You see that also in the Mattel decision, the Hall Street decision. There's a role for state law to play. And I think well, um, since like Concepcion and American Express, you see a stronger preemption though. So there's a tension there. To what extent do we want to allow state law to play a role here? Under the original view, I think there was a robust vision for state law. And I love the sense that uh, if we could regulate or spur on or innovate with uh, dispute resolution, we should let states do whatever they want. Uh, I would love that, that greater innovation that could occur if we let states go free. And uh, I don't like the strong preemptive powers that we see with the FAA currently. So I think that um, there could be a, a lot, there's that seed from Mattel and from Volt of uh, a role for state law to play. And that the more restrained view of the FAA could lead to, uh, I think, more state law developments. Well, I know our time is up, but if somebody else had a question, I just, if, yeah, if we could go another minute, that would be great, yeah. Did anybody else have a question? We've got one right there. Miller, you did an excellent, are doing an excellent I, job. I will say, I got a, he gave me a really good trick, and it's celery without an R. Yeah. It's and celery that, without an R. Yes. Yes. That's why kids say celery, celery. without yeah. celery, yes. real quick. So it's a, that was really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. OK. What she says. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from, from California, the concern we have about uh, our cases, ACAL, um, what what uh, the PAGA cases, you're familiar with the PAGA cases out of California. I'd be very, very interested in the time we have remaining. Just do you see them under threat with uh, the current trends at the Supreme Court? I think Justice Alito in Viking River begrudgingly allowed for these state, these state claims to proceed. Um, but he added a little dig there in Viking yeah, River. Yeah. Oh, there's no standing under state law. What business does the Supreme Court have interpreting and, and saying what state law is? Um, and so I think he threw a monkey wrench. You see, this is what's leading to the, uh, the Uber Adolf uh, debate in the California Supreme Court. Do Calif is there currently standing for workers to bring these claims down? I think once that, once that hurdle is cleared by the California Supreme Court, I think they're going to allow for these claims to proceed. Uh, I think that before Viking River, other states were considering similar PAGA statutes. That's one big area where I think that there could be greater consumer protection and worker protection. We may see a proliferation of more PAGA type statutes once this Viking River uh, litigation uh, runs its course. And that's the, the Uber case that's currently pending. Oh yeah, that's correct. I think the FAA's landscape is going to shrink, which will lead for more room for PAGA, for PAGA type statutes in the states. And I think Viking River opened up that hole. It's going to allow for more states to enact similar PAGA statutes that you see in California.